Hello, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, let me get to where we were. We did that one, I think. We did that, flipped it upside down. Oh yeah, here's where we were. Okay. Negative B over 2A, we proved it with calculus. Calculus, no. not fit on the screen. Oh, we're just missing that little bit, less than one. Uh, take it down to 180 then. Maybe that'll get it for me. Yep, that's gonna fit now. No, it's not. Okay, characteristics of the graph. And then the graph opens up. Okay, we got that already. The graph is narrower than the graph of y equals. I loaded the second lesson, by the way, in your Zoom. It's in the Zoom folder, there's a Zoom or there's a Zoom lessons folder in materials. Lesson two is in there, even though we didn't finish lesson one, lesson two is in there now if you want to look ahead, print them out, open it up. Graph is narrower than the graph of y equals x squared if the absolute value of a is greater than one and wider if it's less than one. Oh, look at that. An equation of x equals some number is a vertical line through that x-coordinate. And what is negative b over 2a? That's the x-coordinate by itself without a y-coordinate of the vertex. So then, of course, the vertical line through that point is the axis of symmetry. The y-intercept is c. Because when x is zero, you're on the y-axis. And then zero in a trinomial like this gets rid of the first two terms, leaving you just c. So that's still the y-intercept. But that's not necessarily the vertex. Only if it was shifted up or down. Um, if it's, shift, if it's not shifted up or down, if it's shifted up or down, then it's not gonna be the vertex. I was trying to finish the homework yesterday. However, I forgot to, but I didn't assign the homework, Thomas, just so you know. We didn't finish the section. You forgot how to graph, but I didn't assign the homework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we're gonna do that today. Yeah in just a couple minutes, 26 participants. I'm trying to move time aside to grade your chapter 12 test, folks. It's, it's a lot of work trying to keep up with everything. I did put in all the homework, several students not doing their homework is very alarming to me. I'm a little bit down today actually because of it. I mean, like I, I feel like I'm working twice as hard as I ever did at campus. And then I, when I see so many students not doing their work, it makes me feel like, well, what am I doing this for? I, I really need all of you to do your work. Um, you know, you're letting yourself down and, you know, I don't mean to say it this way, but you actually are letting me down. I feel down because of it. So um, please, if that's you, get all your work done. It's part of having integrity and character. It, it's 
having integrity and character is more important than succeeding in, at the Science Academy. And you know what, if you have integrity and character, you're gonna succeed at the Science Academy. So um, make sure you understand which one's more important. The integrity and character comes first and then everything else will follow. It may not be what you wanted or what you expected, but it will be, be built on, on character and, and you know, your principles. Anybody out there? Yeah. No. We'll start very shortly now. How is that? I mean, I know that's as much as I could blow it up without it going off screen. There was a one over here even and that went off screen. Can you see it? Or can you see your own? It, it's blurry. Blurry. Let me see. Now I know when I get up here, it changes the... Yeah, it is a bit difficult to read. All right, 8.30, let's go. Here's our, here's what it's saying. This is standard form. Okay, if A is positive, it opens up. If A is negative, it opens down. What does that mean, opens? Well, here it's open. It opens up, opens down. Okay, that's if A is positive. A is greater than zero, A is less than zero. A cannot be zero, all right? You won't have a quadratic then. It will eliminate your quadratic. Okay, so the coefficient is a non-zero. It's either less than zero then or greater than zero. If A is zero, then you have a linear equation. Right, okay. Um, now, if A is greater than one, then it's going to be narrower. It's going to steepen it. If A is less than one and it's a fraction, a proper fraction. Well, absolute value of A. Yeah, absolute value. So what they're saying is it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. The value of it, the absolute value of it is going to narrow it if it's A is more than one. And if A is less than one or between zero and one. Uh, not equal to. If A is between zero and one, then it's a proper fraction. And then you're gonna get a wider one. It's gonna widen it. Now, when you get to the, when you get into algebra two, they'll talk about the nuance of stretching and squeezing. But uh, for our purposes, we're just trying to give you a sample of it so that when you do it, it'll feel very comfortable for you. All right, so I'm not gonna refer to it in terms of stretching and squeezing, because I feel like that makes it more tricky. Um, to try to, you know, take, you know, it takes your focus into such nuance that I don't, really don't know, I haven't seen yet. I'm not gonna rule it out. I don't know why that's, in, it's, it seems trivial to me. It's just nomenclature and when you can see with your eyes intuitively what's happening, that's the most important part to me. Wait. But if your teacher next year decides to make that important, then you'll, Make sure that you find it important. <laughs> okay. Um, the homework today is uh, algebra four point two. Wait it. Yeah, let's wait. Let's wait till we get to it. Okay. Sign any of the homework, Mr. Osta? Did you sign any of it? No. Did you. Oh, I okay. signed it, so I don't want to talk about it. Um, I, I can mention one thing for all of you that are here. Um, your first homework assignment, I made a, a Zoom homework folder. I should have done that. I should have just had the homework attached to the lesson at the end so that all your homework is just at the end of the lesson. So your second 4.2 is not going to be in the homework folder ever. None of that. You're only going to have one homework assignment actually in the homework zoom homework folder, which you have to scroll down to the bottom of materials. It's at the very bottom. So I'm not going to put anything else in the zoom homework folder other than the assignment itself you know, where I can, I create an assignment in Schoology, um, which I think I'm just gonna do that in the regular homework folder. I don't know. But the, the most important thing is, is that the Zoom lessons is where you're gonna go, one-stop shop. Just go to Zoom lessons, open the lesson, 
and at the end of the lesson will be the homework, and we'll agree now it'll always be all the evens. Okay? So it'll be all the evens. Mm -hmm. And I'll always give you plenty of time. I'll give you to the end of the week. And you know what? If you turn it in late, you turn it in at the beginning of the next week, that's fine. But I will put it, I, I, I'm within my rights to mark it uh, missing until you turn it in. If you don't turn it in by the Friday of the week, I assign it. Okay? Um, are we Fair supposed enough. to do that 4.1? No. Nothing has been assigned. I don't assign okay. stuff unless we finish it. Okay. I just showed it to you guys because... Those of you that know how to do it might want to spread it out over two days. It's 27 problems and, you know, half of it's graphing. So it's going to take you some time. Hopefully they won't all be that way. Okay. We talked about the derivative. That makes, when it, the derivative is equal to zero, let's remind ourselves, what is the derivative? It's, it's, a, it's a slope. Delta Y over delta X, change in Y over change in X. But for things that look like this, there is no constant slope, like a line. The slope is always changing. It so like, like acceleration, the velocity is changing, right? It's the, it's the instantaneous so, slope at one point. Yeah, so let's say that this is marking some sort of acceleration problem in physics, Wait. right? You have deceleration and then it comes to a stop and then accelerates in the other direction, right? So what is the velocity at any one point in time? Well, that would be the slope of a line tangent to the graph, and that itself is the derivative. That's what this is, okay? So what, what you're finding, and so you realize, oh, but the slope is not gonna be the same along this graph. It's gonna change, right? So the minimum point, which is where the axis of symmetry goes through. Remember, and vertical lines, what are the equations of vertical lines? X equals some because, number. Yeah. Right? Wait, X equals some number. Yeah. So is a derivative of a line a point or a slope? It's a slope of a line. So der a derivative is a slope? It is a slope of a line tangent to a function or a, or a curve. The, the derivative, simply put, is the slope of a function at one point. It's not between two. You know how normally it's slope convenient. is between yeah, normally the slope is between two points, but this is only at one point. And the now, way you what, do that. Yeah, yeah. So what's curious about that is that students should ask, then students, if they thought about it, should ask, well, don't you need two points? Don't we learn in algebra you need two coordinates? So you can do y2 minus y1. So you can actually find out what the change of y and the change of x are between well, two. But if you only have one point, you need to take and the limit of x delta x to zero. You need to take the limit. Is. Most of them don't know what a limit is, so you can't just throw out a limit. Limit something you learn in, in, in your next year's course in the second semester. And then the limit's going to be um, when you're trying to approach. So let's take our example of um, 0.9 repeating, right? That whole idea of how do you. Oh, get, equals one. What's the largest number less than one? Um, point nine no, infinity minus one. The answer is there is no largest number less than one. There's no such thing. You can always get larger and infinitely increase towards one. So the, but you, 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 you know, the, the idea of a limit is that you're going to um, think about what happens if you were to achieve some sort of infinity or what happens as you're approaching some value that you cannot land on. All right, so the turtle example, Achilles tries to catch the turtle, but the turtle has moved. So he never catches the turtle. The limit solves that problem by looking at the behavior as you're approaching. As you're approaching, then there's the two things I mentioned. There's that you can't ever reach infinity and you can't ever get to the point. And then the two seem to cancel each other out. It's almost like two impossibilities that make a possibility, if that makes sense philosophically. Anyway, we're way off topic now. Well, we're on topic, but we're off on a tangent. Okay, so um, you have this tangent line. It's the slope, it's the instantaneous velocity at that point in time on this acceleration curve, for example. So maybe the acceleration curve is here. What was the velocity at that moment? Of course, the velocity changed at any other moment. It's different, right? So how was it changing at that moment? And that's depicted by the derivative. 
So what? Okay, well, at the derivative is zero. The slope is zero here because it's a flat line at minimums or at maximums, the slope is zero. But that, that is where the vertex is. The vertex is either at the minimum or at the maximum. And the axis of symmetry that makes this a reflection of itself on both sides occurs because of this axis of symmetry. All right, so it goes through that vertex. X equals whatever that X coordinate is at the vertex, all right? And so how do we locate that? With the derivative, we say that, all right, well, I know that if I take the derivative of this, it's giving me the slope and I know what the slope is at that point. I know it's zero at that point. So now watch what I can do with that information. Now we did this yesterday, but I'm recapping it because it is uh, at a different level, you know, that you will be doing in calculus. And then when you get there, it'll just feel very familiar to you, okay? I just had a Bob Ross thought in my head. Okay. Anyway, so this will be 2ax plus b. Okay, and that's, we showed how that works. I'm not going to keep showing you. You'll prove that with the, what uh, Saren corrected me uh, correctly yesterday, um, appropriately, is the power rule of derivatives. Okay, when you take the derivative of a power, this is what ends up happening. This gets multiplied and it loses one on its exponent. Well, if this was already one and it loses one, the X is gone, leaving you B. This was already X to the zero. So the zero got multiplied and zeroed the whole thing out, okay? And then we know that the derivative that we just did is the slope. And at the minimum point or the ver at the vertex, whether it's minimum or maximum, at the vertex, the slope of that tangent line right here in red is zero. Now it's solvable for X, solve for X, and you get X is equal to negative B over two A. So that is the X coordinate, all right? Not only that, that's the equation of the axis of symmetry. X equals negative B over two A is the equation of that vertical line. These are all constants. Two is a constant, A is a constant, B is a constant. So this will just be a number like I had said. X equals a number is this vertical line, okay? All right, great. So now you have the explanation that you usually don't get in an algebra class. The teacher just tells you, hey, remember negative B over 2A, okay? And they don't tell you why, because they don't want to go through the calculus, you know, but you guys can handle it. So you should know that it's not just some magical formula that comes out of space. It, it's you, there for a reason. Did, did you say that um, we're going to have to prove this? No. You said you're going to have to prove the power rule when you get to calculus. In oh, okay. Phew. I thought I'd have to prove that. I'm like, uh-oh. In calculus. Okay, um, what else does this say? Um, the y, okay, by the way, if x is equal to negative b over 2a at the vertex, how would you find the y coordinate of the vertex? Plug in x. You would have to plug it in. It's the same if for any other function when you use derivatives, you just set the derivative to zero, find x, then plug it back in. Yeah, I just want everybody to see, in order to find out what the y coordinate of the vertex is, you can't just use negative b over 2a, that's just the x coordinate. You have to plug that in for x and then find out what that comes out to. Now, the good thing is, is that these will all be numbers that you can just plug in and, and do order of operations, which is why that was a prerequisite. Remember when we started it yesterday? Prerequisite is, can you plug numbers in and use order of operations? That's all you really need. This is what's going on for any set of constants in a polynomial like this, in a quadratic. I just realized, yeah. y, oh, y equals x, you get the line going, for, going forever in both directions. Um, if you do y equals square root of x times square root of x, then you only have half of that. It's from the origin going up to the right forever, but not down to the left. Yeah, because well, that's you, obvious. Because, because you change, can't have negative been, numbers. You change the domain is why. Well, technically, it would multiply to, to x, but since you can't put negative numbers in the square root. Yeah, you, you, what you did is you changed the domain. The domain is what x is allowed to be and still be real. Okay, now you would have in your domain, you would have a set of complex numbers in your domain, which would allow you to graph the rest of the graph. But 
that's that's for another time. A Mr. Okay. Rosenthal? Yes. A what is a derivative? A derivative is a slope of a line tangent to a graph, to a function. It's a slope. If you wanted to simplify it to the smallest word, derivative is a, is a slope. It's not an equation of a line. It's, it's a slope of a line. Did you come in late? No. See that? What, what it basically is. So, hold on, hold on, hold on. Here's, a, here's y equals ax squared plus bx plus c might describe a parabola as such. Imagine that that is an acceleration curve. That parabola is marking some sort of acceleration of an object. It's, it looks like it's decreasing in velocity over time. And then it turns around and starts to increase in velocity over time. Okay? Um, or it could be that it's, it's accelerating in the negative direction and then comes back around to the positive direction. Okay? And is accelerating in a positive way, right? Well, Thomas, what's happening with acceleration? What's changing every moment in when you're accelerating? Velocity. Your velocity is changing every moment of time that passes. So we say with respect to time, right? So because the velocity is changing, and velocity itself is the change in distance over time, okay, then here's the velocity, here's the slope. If you were to map velocity here, velocity would be a, this a line, but it's changing. So at, let's say at this point, how fast were you going at that moment in your acceleration path? If you were to freeze frame it, snapshot it with a photograph, and say, how fast were you going at that moment in time? It would be your rate of change, which is your slope of that line, which is tangent to the curve at that moment. A good analogy would be if so that's what the derivative is. It's not the line itself, which is what a lot of students think at first. It's the slope of the line. It's how it's the it's the rate of change at that moment, at that point, which is the slope. So the derivative is the slope of this line at a point. Okay. All right. Now it's a it's a good analogy would be if you threw a ball off the off the top, off the roof of a building and you wanted to know and the ball froze in time at one moment. How would you know what its velocity was at that moment? That's right. Well, you'd need to use a derivative. Yeah. Okay. Now last point. C at the end of this thing sitting right there. C is the y-intercept. Whether it's the vertex or not, that can change. C is not always where the vertex is. If you translate the parent function off of the origin, it could, if you just move it up or down, then C will be on the y-axis. But once you shift it left or right, it's not going to be on the, 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 the y-intercept is not going to be the vertex anymore. Okay, so it could be, but that is always the y-intercept because where is the y-intercept? It's, it's when, on a coordinate plane, all of these are on the y-axis and all of these have something in common. Their x-coordinates are zero. Right, wherever you are on the y-axis, your x-coordinate is zero. So when x is zero, there's no way you can be off this line. Which when means when x is zero, when you x are zero. on the y-axis, which means, don't interrupt real quick, hold on. When x is zero, this is zero, this is zero, and y is equal to c. So that is a coordinate, zero c, is your y-intercept no matter what. Okay, David, you were saying? Same, uh, cancel out. So if you want to go a re recap of what we're doing here is we're really just picking apart this quadratic. Look at, we haven't even moved on. We've just been analyzing it and looking at it and pulling it apart into pieces. Okay? Is there a way to find the x-intercept? Wait till we start using it. Uh, say that again. Is there a way to find the x-intercept? Yeah, when y is zero. And that's solving a quadratic. Oh, that's, that's finding the root. Wait, Mr. Rosenthal, so why, why did you cancel out ax squared and bx? Because if x is zero, they go to zero. Oh. Okay.
Um, He's trying Andrew to find asked the about the homework. I have not assigned 4.1 yet. I'm hoping if I finish 4.1 today, I will assign it. All right, let's move forward. I want you to try to graph this one now. We can't really see it. I, I know. Give me a sec. I have to go down first and then determine how much uh, zooming I need to do. No uh, pun intended. You need to do an hour a day. Every weekday. Yes. Is that easier to see? You need more magnification? Yeah, but the camera needs to move up. Oh, yeah. We don't see anything. Like yeah, the camera. Folks, one thing at a time, please, I beg you. Let me get this centered. Let me get, I need to get it centered. And then now I can, there you go. How's that? Knowledge. Perfect. Hey, try to, you can always graph with a T table. All right. But don't just graph with a T table. Use what you learned about, you know, the vertex and things like that and where a Y intercept, anytime you can gather points without having to do a T table, start with those points. And then only use the t-table to get the extra points that you need to finish the graph. By the way, how many points determine a line? Two. Two. How many points determine a parabola? One. Three, three five, five, five. Three. It's actually five. three. Oh, never mind. So if you have three points in a plane, there's only one parabola that will go through those points. Oh, yeah. That's a theorem that should be proven, but I don't have that for you today. Well, with two points, you can flip it upside down. With one point, you can rotate it all the way around. David said it upside down, so I have to use that as a moment. Okay, A, this is A, is positive, and it's more than one. So I'm going to say that it's steep and opens up. I know it opens up. I know the y-intercept is six. I know that, I'm gonna plug this in. B is negative eight, A is two. So the X coordinate of the vertex is two. And then I'm gonna plug that in. Negative eight plus six is negative two. So my vertex is at two, negative two. All right, so without a T table, I think that's about all I can do with this in this form. So here's one, Y intercept is zero six. There's one, I have two points. I know, how, I know the, the shape of it, it should be narrow and it should open up, I know that, okay? So now I can start doing some graphing. Okay, so the vertex is at two, negative two. Mr. Zumbel, isn't it just easier to do all of them as a t-table? No, it's important to understand how to find different points because you're going to be asked different physics questions that where you only want to know where the vertex is or you only want to know where the y-intercept is or you only want to know where the x-intercepts are. You need to be able to master this and pick this apart and not just simply do, um, you know, make a t-table and get the graph onto the graph is the least important thing. It's important, but it's not, it's not masterful. I want you guys to be masters of this stuff. Sure. One, two, three, four, five, six. Here's this point. All right. There's the vertex. So you can see what's going to happen. It's going to come down and through here. 
Now, if you if you want to put do a t table of x and y values, I know my axis of symmetry goes through the vertex, right? So I might say that, oh, if this one is two to the left of the axis, then there's going to be one, a reflection point, two to the right of it. All right, so that's at four, six. Look at that, Daniel. No T table still. I'm using reflection, right? Yeah. Now I just need to find one other point. How about when X is negative one? Well, when X is negative one, let's see. 2 times negative 1 squared minus 8 times negative 1 plus 6. So I get 2 plus 8 plus 6. No, something went wrong. Can't be 14. Then it would be higher than that point. Wait, hold on. Oh, because that's 1, not negative 1. Let me change that. When x is 1, 1 squared is 1, 2, this will be minus 8, okay, which will give me negative 6 plus 6 is 0. Okay, so 1, 0 is right here. And look at that. Then the mirror image, the reflection is over here at 3, 0. And there you have it. Okay. Questions about that? Can you repeat how we got the um the x intercepts? Is that just um I accidentally the... got it. I did not do it the way that we're gonna do it later, which is to make y zero in the equation and then solve for x. You would then solve and get these. Oh well, that's what I did. Yeah, okay. you can do that, but but we're gonna do that. But I'm just but... saying now I saw the vertex here, I saw the y-axis, I saw the y-intercept, so I chose one x is one i wanted to see what happened there i ended up on the x-axis somebody's calling me. when you miss huff is calling me hold on one sec yeah hey. hey me Oh, you're filling in those extras? Okay. But you know, in the sample, in the sample that he sent, it did not include PE and those other classes. Well, I, I take it literally because the district, um, you know, it's hard to know what they, they are not that clear in what they're, what they're asking for. So when they, when they give me the sample and that's a sample and it doesn't include PE, it led me to believe that they're not interested in the PE. Sure, sure. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. All right, All right bye. Sorry, everybody. Um, we're just trying to do our uh, administrative duties to uh, secure next year's schedule of courses. So just trying to assist with that. All right, uh, any questions about this before we move on? You said uh, you plug, you make x zero or y zero in the equation. Did you mean like the original? Um, I did not. I did not. Sir, like you, said, you can well, do that and solve the quadratic using the quadratic formula or by factoring, which we're going to get into that. I'm not going to get into it now because I have that plan to get into. Okay. okay. But right now, I did it using other intuitive points. The vertex. How did I find the vertex? Right here. That also gives me the axis of symmetry, and I can use geometry, reflection across the line. Okay. The y-intercept I used and I reflected it. The vertex I had here. 
the axis of symmetry I drew. Then I just found one coordinate to the left, which was at one, x is one, plugged it in here and got zero. Then the other coordinate is a reflection across the axis of symmetry. There, I got all my points. Okay? All right. Moving along. Let's see what else we have in store. Better take the magnification down. It takes forever to load it. Okay, that one and coming down to, okay, that's just the solution we already saw. Okay, um, let's practice this next one here. And you'll get a chance in your homework to practice. So go ahead and do that one. Notice you can find, make these calculations quickly. You don't need much of a T table to do it. Mr. Rosenthal, I could find the 4.1, but not the 4.2. It's in Zoom lessons, it should be. Did anybody, <laughs> else, did anybody else go to Zoom lessons and find that? Yeah, but that's a lesson. Yeah. It says the homework. Are they different or are they the same thing? Okay, so the Zoom lesson folder has going to have all the homework on it now. Okay, so not the Zoom homework? No, that will no longer have new homework in there. That's done. So I hope everybody's listening because I get some students that say, oh, I didn't hear you, and then you missed the test, you know? So you better listen when I talk. The Zoom homework folder was what I first initiated homework in. I'm not going to put any more homework in there. All the rest of the homework is going to be attached to the end of the lesson. So they're all in the lessons. That makes it so it's less clicks for you. You're going to print, you're going to open up the lesson anyway while we're doing it, and then you'll see the homework's right there. Okay, you could just print the last couple pages of the lesson if you just want to copy out the homework. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Let me put the this up here. All right, here we go. Um, one coordinate, the y-intercept is negative one, so zero, negative one. The vertex is at negative b over 2a, so, and that's the axis of symmetry. Okay, so I have, so the x-coordinate being one is, the, the axis of symmetry is x equals one. Okay. Hey, Mr. Rosendahl, how did you get zero comma negative one? The y-intercept is the c at the end. Oh, okay. Okay. Now if I plug one in, I get one squared minus two is negative one. Negative one minus one is negative two. So one negative two is the vertex. This is the y-intercept. I'll call this c. So I found those two points, and I have the axis of symmetry. So I can go ahead and put those down into a graph right now. Zero, negative one. There's my um, y-intercept. One, negative two, there's my vertex. And my axis of symmetry is x equals one. I'm going to reflect this point over to here so that that's two negative one. Okay, this is one negative two. This is zero negative one. Okay, so I have those points. Find one more point. So either go one to the left and do negative one or come one, two, three. Either do negative one or three and plug it in, you know. Okay, how about negative one? Negative one squared is one minus two times negative one minus one. So that's three minus one is two. Okay, negative one, two. And then reflect that across. Okay, there it is. 
This is, these are reflections. That's how I find the other points. Any questions about that? Did you get uh, the negative two in the y intercept or in the in the vertex? The what? The the the, neg the, 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 the negative two. Where 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 do you see negative two? The, the, the vertex. Oh, how did I get it? I plugged x is one into the equation. Okay. Um, Mr. Ostas, is it fine if we used uh, the vertex, the y-intercept point, and its reflection, and the roots only? No, uh, yes. I didn't. I didn't do You're, any. I didn't look like at where your roots design. are going to be, though. Your roots pro might be ira uh, might be irrational. Oh, they are. One is one plus the square root of two. The other one's one minus the square root of two. Yeah, and that might be um, an accuracy of graph problem where it's going to be difficult to find it, you know, precisely where that is. Um, so that that's fine, though, of course. One minus the square root of two is less than zero. Yes, Great. that's why the other root intersects the y-axis where, I mean, intersects the x-axis where x is negative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, let me know, does anybody need to try another one of these? Yeah, I, uh, I think I do. Yes. Yes? Okay. Yes. That's all we needed is somebody to say yes, and then we got it. Okay, so let's do the one to the right of this. Okay, everybody try that one. been taught algebra in so long I can't remember so this is it I wanted to say it feels rusty but it's really like it feels like I'm riding a bike and I feel like I'm right back on the bike riding it again that see that's the difference between memorizing and under when you understand it you just you understand it and you can come back to it and still understand it that's why I don't like doing Kramer's rule and all that stuff without an explanation and makes me very uncomfortable. Okay, so the y-intercept is zero, three. It's mostly to the left of the y-axis. I'm doing negative b over 2a here, and I'm just filling them in. Negative 6 over 4 is negative 3 over 2, or negative 1.5. Does this say only find the vertex and axis of symmetry? Yeah. Uh, no, it's a graph, I think. Negative uh, 1.5 is the x value of the vertex? Graph the function, label the vertex and axis of symmetry. Mr. Wilsenthal. Yeah. Negative 1.5 is the value of x at the, at the minimum? At the vertex. At the vertex? Yeah, I'm going to fill that in now. The vertex? Yeah, I'm going to fill that in now and oh, okay. put a question mark there. And it kind of, if you look at it, you'll see, oh, I know, I got to find that. How do I find that? Plug it in. So 2 times negative 1.5 squared plus 6 times negative 1.5 plus 3. Okay, that's uh, 2.25 times 2 is 4.5 minus 9 plus three, which is minus six, so it's negative 1.5. So it's, it's a square. Okay. And the equation of the vertex, or the axis of symmetry, axis of symmetry, x is equal to negative 1.5. There's the axis of symmetry. Okay. Vertex is at negative one and a half, negative one and a half. Zero three. There's the y intercept. And we can go ahead and get the mirror of that. It's one and a half away from the axis. So one and a half would be here at negative three, up at the same height. OK. 
Okay. And then let's just see what happens at negative one. So at negative one, you get negative one squared is one times two is two. Minus six plus three. Negative four plus three is negative one. Okay, so negative one, negative one is what I got. And then I'll just take the mirror image of that and I have negative, negative two, negative one. Oops. You know what I just did? I looked up to hit the back button. Because <laughs> I, for a second there, I thought I had my smart board. Like to hit undo? Yeah, I was about to go to undo and I'm like, oh, what am I doing? I have to actually erase it. Like, what? I actually have to put that. mechanical work into it? The what? Wow. Okay, any questions about this? That is a beautiful parabola. Yours or mine? Yours. Start with sarcasm, right? Yes. <laughs> Thanks. I uh, don't know why people say dripping with sarcasm. Sarcasm doesn't seem to be a liquid. It seems to be a gas filling the expression. room. Expression. Well, it's a matter of perspective. Does anybody need to see another one of these or have any questions? Um, I uh, find a um, y intercept. It's the number on the end here, the constant. It's the three. Oh. Wow. Just, what did you get for the vertex? Negative, negative one and a half, one and a half, one and a half. Negative one and a half, negative one and a half. Negative one and a half. Well, how'd you get the, wait, how'd you get the y coordinate is one, one negative one? Uh, by plugging it into the equation. Take a look no, here. I know he plugged it into no, the he, equation. No, but he's saying it, it, maybe the calculations didn't work the same. Negative one and a half squared is positive 2.25. Times two is four point five. Six one and a half times is nine. Oh, nine. I see. Never. So negative four and a half. I made, plus a, I made a calculation error. Mm -hmm. It happens. How did you I do that all the time. Okay. Um, sorry. Go ahead. How did you get the um the negative two negative one and the negative one negative one? Well, first I got the negative one negative one by plugging it. I saw well. I have a coordinate here at negative one and a half, and I have another one at x is zero. Let's try one in between at a nice round number, at an integer value, negative one. So I tried on a whim what happens when x is negative one. So I plugged that in. Negative one squared is one times two is two, and I recorded it here. Negative one times six is negative six, and I recorded it here, plus the three, and that comes out to negative one. So negative one goes in, negative one comes out, input, output. That's a coordinate on the, on the parabola. Any What's i cubed? Well, you figure that out. It's negative square root, it's negative i. Negative i. Yeah. We're it's gonna get just, I'm not going ahead with that now because we have a whole section on that. Okay, other questions regarding this. You're gonna get some of these in your homework. Right, and it's really good practice, especially because you're gonna come away from this and you wanna go back to it and refresh it again. Okay, and that will help it uh, stick in your, in your memory. Okay, let's move on. Anybody need to see another one right now? I have another one. No, no need, we've had our fill. We're going to have homework, and you know what? If you want, in office hours, we can come back to it. Let's do it that way. All right. Let's go back to 250, and then we'll crank it up when we need it, as needed. Okay. I'll have to take it down even more. Let's see what this is saying. Oh, minimum and maximum values. Okay, let's see what this says about minimum maximum values. So. Hopefully you're following along on your paper. Let me just determine what this is saying. Why is it not scrolling for me? There we go. Um, the vertex's y coordinate is the minimum value of the function if it opens up. It's a minimum value. Let me just uh, pull this up here. Okay. All right, 
So now I can, I know what they're saying. So let me zoom in here. Okay, so if you look at this graph, the A in the AX squared plus BX plus C is positive. How do I know? What's the language? As the, uh, the thing is opening up. The thing? The vertex is the lowest uh, the of the Y. Parabola. The parabola is opening up, so A must be positive. All right? Therefore, your vertex must be a minimum point. That's all that this is saying. And if A is negative, it opens down. So the vertex. And the vertex must be a maximum point. And you, those are going to be really important in physics. Okay? We're really going to need to, we're going to be focusing, and in calculus, we're really going to focus a lot of our attention on those minimum and maximum points. And for my Stellar Explorers students, um, minimization and maximization is a big part of the sciences in solving real problems in the world, um, you know, in satellites, in astronomy, uh, in economics, minimization curves and maximization. Uh, it's also, it's together, they're, they're referred to as optimization. What is the optimal solution for something is, is usually going to occur at these maximum and minimum points. So really understanding this is very helpful going forward. Oh, there's actually, for if you don't know the solution for a particular problem in terms of the graph, the efficiency of possible solutions, there's actually compu there are actually computer science algorithms that let you find the closest minimum and maximum for a problem solution. And often it, involve, and often it involves backtracking. Potentially, you'd have to go back into an area where, you, where it's uh, less optimal than the solution for which you're aiming. But after that, using randomized methods, you can get back to, you can get back to an optimal solution. Mm -hmm. I, believe it's, I believe one of the methods was uh, simulated annealing. It was used in, at IBM and as a novel method in the late 20th century for the, uh, for the design of optimal uh, for the design of optimal circuits and processing chips. Yep, it's, it's found it in so many locations. So for those of you that are, you know, where, where, where does this, why does this all matter? Uh, there's plenty out there of why, you know, where you use optimization to get the optimal solution in, in the sciences. Is the curve that everybody's talking about now, like flatten the curve and stuff that was with, yeah, yeah. Um, is that, a parabola? Oh, no, it's just exponential no. growth. No, that, that's, that's a different curve, but no, the curve... They're going to be able to... Wait. It could no, be no, no, the other... The it, other could be following, it could be following something like that. Okay. I think it's a bit... Uh, well, the curve for the whole virus as a whole spreading is a sigmoid curve, I think, and the curve for flattening the curve is a bell curve, isn't it? Well, okay, so because first of two all, different things. there's... Exponential growth looks something like this. This is an exponent, this will have some exponent, x to the n there, okay? It's going to increase exponentially in how it's spreading. Um, it could be some, something strange like a Fibonacci type thing where, you know, you're adding to the number before it, you know, that, that type of thing. But flattening the curve means that you stop this exponential growth and this, slope starts to change. It becomes flatter and flatter instead of steeper and steeper so that you end up getting something like this. That would be the sigmoid, okay. right? Yeah. Like a square root graph. Okay. And so instead of increasing, you are now changing the trajectory of increase <coughs> spread. Okay. Um, yeah, but flattening what? the curve would apply to the number of people who are hospitalized. In that case, it would it, be. It depends doctor, on what you're measuring, it? yes. Why does the vertex get wider as you increase the ex exponent? The vertex is a point. A point has no width, length, or depth. Okay, but if you go on Desmos and do y equals x to the power of n and increase n, you'll notice that the base gets wider and the angles get. I'm not in the Desmos with everybody right now, so we can talk about that at another time, or maybe even during office hours, but right now let's stick to this. Tell whether this function has a minimum value or a maximum value, then find that value. Okay, so look here. Opens up or down is the first question. 
I'm waiting. It opens up. It opens up. So what does it have? Minimum value. It has a minimum value. Now we find it. Like that. Okay. B is negative 18. A is 3. You get 18 over 6, which is 3. That's the X value. Plug in the X Isn't value. Isn't it supposed to be negative? Oh, never mind. 3 squared is 9. 9 times 3 is 18. 18 times 3 is 54 plus 20. Okay, so uh, what is that? Negative 2 or something? No, 38. So you have 38 minus 54 is negative 16. Uh, is that right? Yes. It's not 18, it's negative 67. 3 squared, no, oh, you're right, 27. Thank you. 3 squared, 9, 9 times 3, 20. 27 divided, 27 oh, minus double. You're right. Plus. You're right. So this is negative 27 plus 20 is negative 7, okay? So when I plug this in, you get negative 7. So then the coordinate of the vertex is at 3, negative 7, and it is a minimum point. Okay? That's how that kind of question goes. And that you're, you would have answered it. That's all you need to do. You don't need to graph it. You know, I could also find the minimum, maximum, and saddle points of three-dimensional uh, functions as well. Sure. But then you'd have to use a complicated, it's a really complicated method. It's like Hessian matrix and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving along. Uh, that's the solution we already found. All right, go karts. There's a problem for us to work on. So now that you can see, the problems are going to start to question us on how can we apply what we just learned only if you understand it. So, oh no, this. So I have a question about I have a question about the minimum thing. Uh huh. So minimum is basically the vertex. If it opens up. What do you mean it opens up? Like the. If the graph of the parabola opens up, then it has a minimum point. You mean faces up? Opens up is the language we're using. Okay. It opens up. See, it opens. Because up is and the way And then it the opens. maximum is the vertex of the thing going down. Yeah, what's the minimum here? Uh, there is no minimum. There's no minimum. Here, there's no maximum. Okay. All right, let's look at our go-kart cart problem. Hopefully, you have it on a paper or you have it on your screen somehow, sharing your screen. Uh, in another window, you have it open, maybe. But go ahead and open your PDF for um, this page, page 13 out of 14. A go-kart track has about 380 racers per week and charges each racer $35 to race. The owner estimates that there will be 20 more racers per week for every $1 reduction in the price per racer. How can the owner of the go-kart track maximize weekly revenue? I want you to take two minutes of, of silently trying to do the problem, and then I'm going to open it up to discussion. Oh. Go. I'll try to intensify it if you really don't have access to your PDF or the computer. But you should. It's in Schoology, and it should have been open already. Uh, which page did you say? 13 out of 14 of the PDF. If I can get it into screen, not quite. Let me uh, shrink it down to 280, maybe 285. Nope. Let's go to 275. Nope. 250, maybe. You can't get it in there. It's close. All right, so it's weird, right? This problem is not necessarily obvious how to set, up, set this up, but you should be trying to find the polynomial that would give you this situation. You whited out the solution. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, it's in my picture. I took the picture and cropped it. That's all I did.
Okay, you guys want to start discussing ideas for how to set this up and how to justify why that's your equation. Anybody? You're trying to maximize revenue. So your, your revenue would be Y. You're trying to find the maximum point of Y. If you're trying to find a maximum, you're gonna get a parabola that has a negative to start with. It's gonna be negative something. But how are we gonna get that? What is your revenue made of? It's the amount of racers, right? amount of racers, call that R, times how much it costs, right? Maybe X is how much it costs to race. All right, so the owner estimates that there'll be 20 more racers per week. Oh, Mr. Osla, you could construct a quadratic equation by doing f of x minus n, where n is the reduction you're making in price, equals x minus n multiplied by 380 plus 20n. F of it, hold on, too fast, too fast. f of x, what does it stand for? The revenue or? Yeah, the amount of the the amount of the amount of money you're earning as a function of the of thirty five dollars minus the reduction. So if you know x is thirty five dollars, you get a quadratic equation with n, which is the amount of reduction you have to make as the uh, uh, you get n the amount of reduction you have to make as the main value, and you can just find the minimum or maximum of that. It's minimum because okay. it's negative. So you want to start with thirty five dollars per race and subtract. N is what you want to do. 35. Yes. Okay, so 35 minus N, N being how, many, how much money you're going to reduce it. Okay. So what happens when I reduce it by $1? You get 400. Uh, you get 400 races, but revenue is only well, the amount of racers, the, 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 change, the change in R. The change in R, right? This change, rate of change here will be um, 20 more, right? For every $1, right? Yeah, Mr. Rosenthal, if you did, uh, so the way I did it was, I, first off, I did X minus N, which is how much revenue you'd be making per racer, times 380 plus 20 n which is the number of new racers you have 20 n because is, okay, for every so, n dollars you reduce you get 20 racers you, okay so every, 30 35 minus n represents what that represents the amount of revenue you'll be making per racer price this is the price per racer yes okay yeah. what else do i need multiplied by parentheses 380 plus 20 n 20 right. n so, because so you, you start with 380 racers and add 20 times the amount of n that you n is the amount of do, uh, the amount of money you took off the charge i agree with that 380 minus 20 n and what you're doing is you're getting your <laughs> amount you're getting your amount of racers here is it plus 20 it should be plus 20 because you get 20, 20, right, more right. 20, do, 20 more racers for every amount, a dollar, for every one that you increase. So it's 20 times the amount that you increase it by adds that to the 380 racers. But every time you increase it by one, you have to subtract that as a dollar amount from the $35. And then that's how much you charge. I like that. I think that this is correct. Okay, great. Now, what does this come out to when you multiply? What's uh, 35 times 380? 35 times 20n, negative n times 380, negative n times 20n. So you're gonna get this. So you're gonna get negative 20n squared. I'm gonna get um, 35, to, it's gonna be 700n. Okay, and then I'm going to get negative n times 380 is negative 380n. And then I'm going to get 35 times 380. 
35 times 380. 13,300. I'm just getting two vertical lines. Hold on. Now I'm going to simplify the middle terms. And what do I get? I get 320. Okay, so the maximum, this opens down like we want, like we wanted, like we said we needed it to to get a maximum. But the location of the maximum point is going to be the negative b over 2a. So we have a little bit of work to do, but you have your calculator. Okay, so x here, or it's actually n in this case, which represents um, the amount of money you're going to drop the price. Okay. N is going to be negative B over 2A. B is 320. A is negative 20. So this is 320 over 40. Negative over a negative is a positive. 32 over 4 is 8. It's $8. What value does Y represent? What value does Y represent? Y represents the, res the revenue. Oh, okay. Yeah. The revenue is based on whatever the price is times however many guests. Now you just plug it into F of X yeah. minus N to get the total well, revenue. So eight is the amount of money you're going to drop the price. What is the question? How can the owner, what did it say? How can the owner, Take it to 200 so I can see it's it. It's the vertex. And it says, how can the owner of the go-kart track maximize weekly revenue? Well, it, it would be by dropping the price $8. We don't really need to go any further. By dropping the price $8, he would maximize revenue, right? It didn't ask what the revenue would be, right? So we're done. Yes. What the, what the owner needs to do is drop the price from $35, take eight off, and he'll make it $27. If it's $27, then you're going to get 160 more racers. So you're going to have four, 540. You're going to have 540 racers, and you're charging them $27 each. So if you wanted to find the revenue at the maximum, this is what it would be, 540 times 27, $14,580. $14,580 is what the maximum revenue he can get. Okay? Any questions about that? We're a little bit over time. Let's see what's on the next page. That's just the solution. The solution. And look, exactly what you had said. 35 minus X times 380 plus 20 X. Okay. All right. Um, so here in this first example, I did not um, put the homework on the end of it. From now on, the homework is actually right after the lesson. And it's always going to be the evens. But for this first one, you're going to find the homework in the Zoom homework folder only this one time. And you're going to do all the evens. Okay. Any questions about that? Did we finish uh, all of the evens? All of the evens, yes. There's 27 problems in total for you to do. Okay. So do the entire assignment um, with just the evens. All the evens, yes. Okay. Dismissed. We're on office hours. Thank you. You betcha. It's due Friday. Can't stay on because John wants them. Okay, bye. Yeah. Wait, when wait. You say do the evens, do you mean do the go, evens sir. that are in like the... the when is it, thing? when does it start? Right now. It's due Friday. Oh, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Have a good day. See you tomorrow. You bet. Bye. Bye. Anybody else have any questions for me? Anyone? Andrew, Dylan, Joseph, Kate, Lawrence, Max, Victoria, Zara, Jillian. 
The homework is 4-1. 4-2 is, is there at the end of the next lesson, but I have not assigned it. I'm just assigning 4-1 now, just the evens. Oh, good, Natalie, you got the, the correct, yeah, you had put the correct equation for that last problem. Andrew, the homework is 4-1 in the Zoom homework folder at the bottom of your materials page. It's in there. Just do the evens. Do on Friday, 4.1. 4.2 I have not assigned yet, Andrew. Oh, and he's not in here. Anybody else have a question? All right, I'm gonna end the session. See you guys tomorrow.